Welcome back to The Wardrobe. And my latest guest who I spoke to for podcast radio, it's a bloke who's been accused of being a Russian spy. He sent a very famous email, if not the most famous email ever sent, which sent ripples through the establishment in America that people are still talking about today. He was mentioned extensively in the Mueller report, which looked at whether the Russians had anything to do with the um, the US election in 2016. He's not Russian. He's British. And he's not a spy. <laughs> he's a showbiz promoter and publicist, as well as being a journalist. And along the way, he's spent a lot of time with some very, very big showbiz names, including Michael Jackson, sporting names like Muhammad Ali. He's done everything. He's lived in at least three different countries. He's an amazing bloke, and uh, we had quite a chat. This is Rob Goldstone. Rob Goldstone, you've done so many things, and now you've got a fantastic podcast, which is called An Englishman In. You've been a, a journalist, you've been in PR, you've been in music management. How would you describe yourself? What do you do now? Uh, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades, I suppose. Um, I, what do I do now is interesting. Uh, somebody used this horrible phrase recently and said, you're like a media personality. And for me, they're only second to like, I don't know, the scum of the earth or something. So I don't really know what I am. But I, I you know, I, I have been a journalist. I have been a publicist. I have been a music manager. And I wrote a book and I'm doing a podcast. And I get interviewed about all things Trump and Russiagate, primarily. Okay, well, the reason why you're connected to Trump and Russiagate is because you wrote one of the most famous emails in history. Uh, during the presidential campaign, 2016, you sent an email to Donald Trump Jr. Do you just want to talk us through what happened there? Uh, sure. It's my uh, it's my least favorite subject, um, <laughs> but the only so, one that anyone ever wants to talk the only about. One I cares about. Yeah. Um, so basically, I, you know, I had got to know Donald Trump and his son a little bit because I was managing a Russian pop star named Emin, and in doing so, we ended up doing uh, the Miss Universe contest at Emin's venue that he owned in Russia. And so we got kind of friendly, I suppose you would say, with the Trumps. And a year or two later, he now famously called me and asked if I would mind calling the Trumps to set up a meeting with the Trumps, somebody within the Trumps who was running for president, we may add, at that time, and a well-connected Russian attorney whom his father had met that day and who had some kind of damaging information on the Democrats. And I was shocked because, first of all, Emin had never taught politics with me ever. We taught music. He played video games. He was a bit crazy, but it, we'd never taught politics. So I tried to, as any journalist would, push him for a little bit more information. And I asked him what it was about, what it meant. And he said, why do you care? It doesn't matter. You don't have to go to the meeting. You don't have to report on the meeting. Can you just get the meeting? And I pushed back a couple of times. Uh, and at which point, I don't know if you've had this, but there comes a time when you know your client that there's no point in pushing anymore. You can either say yes, you can say maybe, or you can say no and perhaps look for a new job. What I did say to him was that no good could come of this. And that was based on the idea in my mind that we were wasting a favor with a man who could become the president of the United States for some random attorney, according to him, that was some friend of his father. And that's why I said that. A lot of people thought I said it because of the gravitas of what was contained within the ask. It wasn't. It's because selfishly, I thought, if Donald Trump becomes president, and we're a bit friendly with him. I know where your next video will be filmed, and it's a big white house. Now, the the content of the email seems to be the problem. Right. It, it, 
I've got it in front of me. It says, Emin... Now, so this is the email you sent to Donald Trump Jr. And Donald Trump Jr.'s official title during the campaign? What was that? Was he... He, was, he wasn't the camp... He wasn't running, looking after the campaign, was he? That was the other fella. He was kind of like the unloved son. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have a title. He right, was okay. Donald Trump's son. But obviously, was, he was, but obviously it's his dad. Yeah, yeah. And you, you said... Emin just called and asked me to contact you with something very interesting. The Crown Prosecutor of Russia, and we'll get back to that phrase, the Crown Prosecutor of Russia met with his father, Aras, who is a, a Moscow-based developer, tried to partner with Trump uh, uh, years before that. Anyway, he says, um, this morning, in a meeting, offered to provide the Trump campaign with some official documents and information that would incriminate Hillary and her dealings with Russia and would be very useful to your father. That right. that was a, a puffed up version of, of what you had, wasn't it? It was a puffed up version of the truth and it was a puffed up version of a half truth because Emin wouldn't give me all the information. So what he told me when I said, well, who is this attorney? He said, a prosecutor who's well connected. So when I hear well connected, I was a journalist, I'm a publicist. Well, she's not connected to the local scouts or the <laughs> local Aldi. She's in my mind connected to the Kremlin. She's a prosecutor. The word crown prosecutor is very interesting. So because I'm told that she's a prosecutor, to me with my British hat on, I call prosecutors crown prosecutors because it's the crown prosecution. As anyone who knows history will know, there hasn't been a crown in Russia since 1917. So there isn't a crown prosecutor. What I should have said is he met with a crown prosecutor, not the. Because even though there wasn't a the, what the media took that to mean was a man who is in fact the prosecutor general of Russia, who they assumed I was talking about, well, I've never heard of that man. I just meant that she, in effect, was what in the States we call a federal prosecutor and what in England you would call a crown prosecutor, meaning they prosecute people, they don't defend people. Now, provide documents and information. Well, if you have information, as Emin told me, which was potentially damaging to the Democrats, you must have a bit of paper, you must have some documents. But he never told me there were documents. I just was like, there's documents, there's paper. If there isn't, who cares? But you decided and, you decided to interpret that, or at least in the email, correct. incriminating that could incriminate yeah. Hillary. So it was that much was heavier worst than part about that. No, no, that was the worst <laughs> part. So the idea was that this information, whatever it was that this lawyer had, was in some way damaging to the Democrats. Now again, I did work for the Sun for a while. If it's damaging to the Democrats, the only Democrat that anyone cares about in the Trump world is the one who's running against him, who's Hillary Clinton. But I have on many occasions apologized for only one thing, which is it had nothing to do with Hillary Clinton. And my email sound, makes it sound like it incriminates something she has done. What it really does was incriminate these people that the lawyer for donating to her campaign. So the words were really twisted the wrong way around. But I've said that from the beginning, that wasn't my intention. If I had one regret, it would be to take Hillary's name out. Because if Bernie was running, it would have said Bernie Sanders. If Boris Johnson was running, it would have said Boris. It was about the party. I interpret it as Hillary, because again, I'm a publicist. So the trigger for me is, you need key words to get people's attention. Hillary will get the attention. Democratic National Convention, maybe they won't read. The intention with this email was to get Donald Trump Jr.'s attention enough to read the email, but see what I put at the end, which was, but maybe you should speak with Emin directly about it first. Now, that That's bit the, hasn't been as publicized as the rest of the email, has it? Especially because what has been publicized is Don Jr.'s response, <laughs> which was, if it's what you say it is, I love it. But he also said, I agree. I should speak to Emin about it. Can you set that up? I then set up that call in a series of emails which have all been made public, but which the media ignored. 
those two spoke and I never thought about it again. Because if you think about it, why would I care? Even if, for two reasons, if I'm right about everything I've supposed in this email, they will have spoken about it. If I'm wrong, equally they will have spoken about it. So once they agreed to speak, and more importantly, once they did speak, I didn't care how puffed up this was because two human beings have spoken to each other. So I assume they speak about the words that they're both copied on in the email. And the idea was to get a meeting. So really, you did your job. You got them to want a meeting and you set the meeting up. So you were really only a fixer, a middleman, really. I mean, you've been accused of being a Russian spy. Yeah, I was Putin's <laughs> puppet, but interestingly enough, which is lovely, which interestingly enough, I was also accused of being Hillary's puppet. A lot of people think I set this up on behalf of the Democrats to discredit Trump ultimately when this would come out. What's interesting is, as I've testified on numerous occasions, both on Capitol Hill and to Mueller, I wasn't pro-Trump. I wasn't pro-Hillary. I was pro my client. So all I was trying to do was do my job to a billionaire client who, by the very nature of that word, makes them hugely demanding. They're not used to having people say, oh, I couldn't do that, or no. And by the nature of the job I did, I was his manager. I wasn't just his publicist. We were 24 hour a day. We talked eight hours a day about nonsense. It's just another ask. It was an annoying ask, but it didn't set off a, a bell. A lot of people go, didn't you know it was wrong? And what I say is, because just so that your your viewers, your listeners understand, I was told by the Mueller team, you can write whatever you want in an email. We're not saying your email was wrong. Their willingness to accept what potentially was foreign interference is what could be wrong. So mm-hmm. they said, this, as long as you don't threaten to kill somebody in email, do whatever, you can say whatever you want. The intent to receive it was what was being examined. So when people say to me, as many people do, how could you not know it was wrong to offer this? Well, I grew up in Manchester. I know nothing about this. The chairman of the Trump campaign was in the meeting. You would think he knows something about American legal system as it relates to politics. You would hope. Actually, you wouldn't hope because he's in jail. I think they just let him out for COVID, Paul Manafort, but he was jailed. So maybe he didn't know either. The thing that when I first read it, I thought this all seems very, very suspicious and I'm not sure if I'm buying your story. Now, talking to you, I see exactly what's going on. And to give it some context, that first line of your email that said, Emin just called. So he's a pop star from... Azerbaijan or, or Russia? Yeah, he's from Azerbaijan. He lives in Russia. They all, Trump, Donald in particular, was already very fond of him because of the dealings you'd had with Miss Universe. Do you want to just talk us through that so that it makes more sense? Because on the face of it, it looks like, well, this pushy British promoter has tried to set up a meeting with the, the Trump you know, with Donald. I mean, Donald was in the meeting and, and uh, with, with the, the high Don ranking... Don Jr. was. Donald Trump wasn't in it. But oh, Donald, Donald Trump wasn't in the meeting. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, Donald Jr. was in it, but uh, high ranking officials from the, the Trump campaign were in it. You know, how does a guy like that do that? That doesn't sound... It doesn't sound like that's how things work. Yet, just give us a little bit of background about the relationship that Donald Trump had with Emin and how that came about via Miss Universe. So so you're exactly right. And it does sound bizarre. It's a good word (laughs) to most people. Um, So back in 2012, I began managing Emin. And one of the things I wanted to do, because he'd grown up in the States, he lived in London part of the time, as well as in Moscow, was to internationalize his music. And I knew we needed some global platforms. And it just so happened that I happened to know someone who had been named Miss Universe. And we needed a beautiful woman for his video. And I said, well, why don't I ask her? She's called Diana Mendoza. I said, why don't I ask her? And I asked her, I said, would you like to be in his video? She said, no. I said, thank you very much. And she said, but I'm happy to connect you with the Miss Universe organization and maybe they can help. 
she did. I spoke to the president of Miss Universe, who was very nice, and she said, come in, have a meeting. And I said, well, Emin's going to be here in a couple of weeks. We'll both come in. And we went in, and he's extremely charming and funny and whatever. And so we had a great meeting. But it ended up not being about his video because we talked about, Emin suddenly said, where are you doing this year's contest? And they said, we haven't locked down a location. He said, what about Moscow? And I should point out, Emin and his family are like the Trumps of Russia. They own a lot of retail and commercial developments, including one of the best concert halls or performance venues in Moscow. And so they said, well, we have thought about Russia before. It's full of red tape. It never happens. And at which point, Paula Sugar, who's the head of Miss Universe, said, I even went to look at this venue uh, a year or two back called Crocus City Hall. We could never get dates. It was never open. And Emin smiled and looked at me and said, well, you should just tell her. And I said, well, he owns it. So um, it was kind of like, oh. And he said, well, why don't we just do it there? And it was as simple as that. It went on from there. Now, the reason we're talking about this is because Donald Trump was a co-owner of Miss Universe. He owned it with NBC TV. And so... It was suggested that we all meet again in a month in Las Vegas. And at that meeting would be Donald Trump. And Emin would bring his father, Araz, who ran this billion-dollar empire. And they'd have like a, hello, how are you, and sign a contract. And they would announce on stage that night at Miss USA that Moscow would be the host. And that's how I got to know Donald Trump. And that's how... Emin got to know Donald Trump. And even though it's been written that I've been friends of the Trumps for years, I mean, I've literally been written about as if I am their long lost adopted son. I mean, it's unbelievable how people have described me. I've met Donald Trump either five or six times, and I met his son, Don Jr., twice. Right. And I've met you once. Yeah. So you're halfway there. (laughs) (laughs) But the thing that really connected them was when was in Las Vegas, wasn't it? Yeah, they really bonded. I mean, first of all, Donald Trump is Donald Trump. So even though uh, Emin's family were about, according to Forbes magazine, the 54th or 53rd richest family in Russia, when they appeared in the Trump Hotel in in, uh, Las Vegas, I happened to be in the lobby and Trump bellowed across the lobby, look who's come to see me, the richest family in Russia. Now, He knew as well as everyone else. They were the 53rd. But that doesn't bother Donald Trump. When you're in his presence, you're the richest family. Where they seemed to bond was he invited himself to a dinner that night that Emin was giving for his friends and family. And it was a real cast of characters. It was interesting. And I was organizing it. And I was the one that got the call from Trump's uh, security assistant, Keith, who said, "Um, Mr. Trump would like to come to dinner. Where is it? And I, of course, told him, he goes, is that okay? I said, yeah, absolutely fine. And I hung up and I called Emin and he was like, what? And I said, you you obviously made an impression. Donald Trump's coming to dinner. And he goes, okay, I have two requests. One, you deal with it. And B, you sit between Trump and I. And I was like, okay. So we go down for dinner, we have dinner. And there was a moment, which I think is what you're referring to, where they, to me, they bonded, where... Trump stopped the conversation and said, Emin, I have a question for you. If I was to take a million dollars off the cost of putting on, of licensing this show, Miss Universe, to you and your family, would you tell me if you've slept with any of the contestants? And everyone's like, ha, 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 how funny. And Emin, cool as a cucumber, said, that's really interesting. Mr. Trump, and he always called him Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump, I'll pay you an additional $5 million if you tell me if you've ever slept with any of the contestants. And there's this silence, and Trump laughs and goes, should we just drop the deal? And it was funny, because I was like, there you go. There's a bonding made in frat boy heaven. (laughs) They were like two silly frat boys that had out not shocked, but you know what I mean. They'd out shocked the table. And from then on, they were friendly. We went out to a nightclub afterwards. Trump again said he'd like to come. Uh, it was a, a place called The Act, which the equivalent in England would be The Box. Uh, it's a sort of sexy burlesque nightclub. It's supposedly artistic in its design. And, you know, there were acts 
at that club where people simulated peeing on each other. A lot has been written about the fact that perhaps that's where the rumor of the pee tape comes into it. Um, and they really got on well, so well that he wouldn't leave. So the entire evening I had Emin in my ear going, get rid of him, when's he going home? And all I remember saying to Emin was, I'm British, so let me explain. This is royal protocol. Think of him as the queen. You don't move till he moves. And we stayed and he stayed a couple of hours and the second he left, we all left. And that was it. After that, friends, when Emin would come to New York, maybe three or four times, he would say, let's go and see Mr. Trump. Trump was always very gracious. He always found time for us. It was a 10 minute visit, perhaps. And on one of those occasions, I remember two very old, three. On one occasion, he was listening to rap music when we appeared. And I walked in, he goes, you're in music. Look, I've got this platinum disc. And I looked and he goes, yeah, this, is, this song, it's called Donald Trump. And it's got 90 million views on YouTube. And I said, I would just suggest you listen to the words of that song. And we all laughed and he said to me, I don't care about the words. It's got 94 million views on YouTube. He didn't care about the words. That plaque was on his wall. Another time we went in, we'd been in this wind swept, it was raining. And he looked at me and he went, there's something weird with your hair. And I said, if we're gonna have a hair debate <laughs> and one of us loses, it isn't me. And he laughed because that's Donald Trump. He's like, and then the final time was a few months before he announced his run for president. And he told Emin and I, he said, I'm running for president. And we were like, wow, that's amazing. And Emin was like, you know, I, 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 that really is incredible. We congratulated him on the way out. We got to the bottom in Trump Tower and we both said the same thing. You know, he's gonna win. And we each said, well, there's no question of it. And then Emin said to me, and neither of us asked him which party he's running for. And I said, because it doesn't matter. He'll win anyway. <laughs> and we both believed from that minute that he had a certain way. I believed America has become a bit of a reality show as a nation. And who better to be the reality show president than Donald Trump? Right. So to me... Is that what is, you think it is? Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of people thought it was another Ross Perot thing, didn't they? It was just a, a rich man who wanted his vanity project. He had an art. He didn't get to be Donald Trump without having a certain... He has a blustering sort of buffoon quality that when you're around him makes you believe that he's your mate, he's your best friend, and he's looking out for you. I famously said on CNN, which I thought was funny, that he would run over you in his Rolls Royce to get to his gold-plated toilet in Trump Tower, and you would still vote for him and think he was your best friend. Because that's the ability he has. And I have to say, he's in the five or six times I met him, he's only ever been polite, gracious, done ridiculous things. I asked him to do a video for Emin's dad's birthday. He did it at like seven o'clock in the morning. I asked him to do a music video for Emin at literally six or seven in the morning. He did it. We gave him one day's notice to do it. And so I think he likes chaos and drama. But that was no question. I think he is unfiltered. And when people say to me now, can you believe how Donald Trump behaves? I'm like, well, yes, have you ever seen Donald Trump? He behaves like Donald Trump. You mm. just thought you were electing somebody who would be different once they've been elected. He's always been that person. It's just magnified. So let's fast forward to June 2016 and this meeting that you've set up. The, the Trump camp are expecting dirt on Hillary. Uh, what happened next? Well... In the perfect storm, as they say, I was supposed to, of course, not attend, not be there, have no relevance. But I was supposed to go and introduce this, this gang of merry men and one woman to Don Jr. Only because I'd met him a couple of times, they hadn't. And I thought that was a fair ask. So I met them at Trump Tower. I took them up in the elevator and handed them off to Don, who then said, well, where are you going? And I said, I'm leaving. He goes, oh, just stay. Now, again, in the same way as with Emin, you make those split second decisions, which is, it's the son of someone who could become the future president of America, asking you to stay, who cares? That was my thing. I can check my emails, what difference does it make? There's a good and a bad to that, because on the one hand, it put me in the center of the most famous meeting of at least the 21st century. <laughs> but there is something good for that, because if I hadn't sat in on that meeting, 
and everything that came out about what people believed, supposed, went on. Well, I might have been one of those people that also believed that it was much more sinister. Because I was sitting there, I know what happened. So I was kind of like, as the Mueller team told me, you're like a witness to a very serious accident. We need to hear from you because you don't have any benefit on either side. It wasn't your meeting. You don't care. But you were a witness to it. So I told them the same as I'll tell you, which is, you know, it started out and this this attorney spoke about this damaging information to the Democrats. But her version of it was that these people named Bill Browder and the Ziff brothers had made donations to Hillary's campaign and they don't pay tax in Russia. So therefore, these were illegal donations. It should never have been done. It's outrageous and all of that. And how dare they give money to the Democrats? And I remember sitting there thinking, I don't know those people, but didn't Donald Trump used to support the Democrats? I literally, it was amusing me. And I thought, well, anyway, she'll get to the point eventually. And then she rambled a bit. And Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, was sat next to me. And I saw him fidgeting. And he looked very uncomfortable. And he suddenly said to her, I have to stop you. I have no idea what you're talking about. And I thought, good, because I'd like to have said that. She then began from the exact place, as if you're reading something really boring and someone said, stop, but she began it again. And I could see him so tense that he was texting desperately. We later learned that he was texting his assistant saying, get me out of this madhouse, basically. And Don Jr. was the next one to pipe up and said, with the best will in the world, I don't know why you're addressing this to us. My father's a private citizen. You should address it to the Obama administration. And she said what she really wanted to talk about was something called the Magnitsky Act. I had never, ever heard of it. I'm since an expert on it. And it's where, because of sanctions imposed by uh, America on Russia over somebody called Sergei Magnitsky, who apparently was murdered by the Kremlin because of I don't know what, Russia imposed an adoptions freeze and so when you hear things like that meeting was about adoption, it was about adoption. This lawyer was trying to get those sanctions removed because it was causing a lot of issues for families who wanted to adopt children and suddenly couldn't. So if you've been waiting a year or two years and your child was now ready to be, you couldn't adopt a child from Russia or the former Soviet Union because of these rules. And so she was a lobbyist to have the Magnitsky Act overturned. And the very people she was saying were doing something dodgy in their donations to Hillary's campaign were almost the writers, the creators of the Magnitsky Act. So it's all joined up. The media didn't bother to join up the dots. And they said, it's outrageous that Don Jr. said it's about adoption. How ridiculous. Sounded like a cover story. Sounded like a ridiculous cover yeah, story. Yeah, it was about adoption. And in fact, so much so that when the meeting was over, because Don ended the meeting, I jumped up and herded them out like cattle to get them out. I was hugely embarrassed. And it takes quite a bit to embarrass me. And he put his arm on my shoulder and I said, I have to just tell you, I've never been as embarrassed. And Don said to me, I just have no idea what that was about. And I said, adoption, apparently. And when we walked out of it, the only thing I would have, someone had put a gun to my head one year later, one minute, and said, what was that meeting about? I would have said, adoption. I just don't know why. And so it wasn't a lie. It was a half fact. When, when they asked him what it was about, what I believe he should have said was, it was about adoption, but we thought it was going to be about blah, blah, blah. What he kept saying was it was about adoption. He didn't give it context. And as I've learned over this last few years, context is what matters. It was about adoption, but they went into it thinking it was about something completely different. So was it just a massive understanding, maybe even caused by the language barrier, or was there a bait and switch going on here? There was, I think it was a bit of a bait and switch. It wasn't a language issue. It was that um, to her, and to President Vladimir Putin, Magnitsky is a huge thorn in their side. I say that because years later, he and President Trump stood together in Helsinki. They did some big meeting there. And one of the only things Putin talked about was the Magnitsky Act. And as I heard him talk about Bill Browder, I was like, wait, this is all these names that came up at my meeting 
that they're dismissing as nonsense. It's obviously not nonsense to Vladimir Putin. And if you're a lawyer that has some connection to the Kremlin, well, it is important. So just because somebody at the New York Post or the whatever doesn't understand the connection doesn't mean it was hugely important. And there was, when I say in my email, they have damaging information about Hillary, whatever. Well, there was damaging information about funding to her campaign, but it wasn't damaging because to the Trump campaign, who cares if they're donating? She cared because she wanted to say these horrible Magnitsky people who you support, or not you, who America support, are donating to Hillary's campaign, bad people. Mm. And, and that's why it made no sense. And that's why they stopped the meeting and said, this is a waste of time. Like, we don't even know what you're talking about. So it was a big jigsaw puzzle. It had lots of pieces. But the bottom line is the meeting lasted about 15 minutes. It was the most awful 15 minutes I've ever spent. <laughs> and at the end of it, we went downstairs and I called Emin in the middle of the night in Russia and said, this was the single most embarrassing thing you've ever asked me to do. And you're someone that's asked me to do a lot of really, really embarrassing things. And I never want to speak about it again. And I hung up on him. And we never did speak about it again until the emails broke. It sounds like you just got caught up in all of this and the Mueller report basically backs everything you've said. In fact, if it was some sort of covert meeting, you didn't even try to hide it. You like had, didn't you have your Facebook? You, you, you... I did check in on Facebook and yeah. said meeting at Trump Tower. And I have to say <laughs> that the Mueller people did say, would we be writing? Because you have to understand when people interview you, like Bob Mueller's people, like Congress, they know the answer. They just need you yeah. to say it. Yeah. So when they said to me, would we be right in thinking you weren't exactly keeping the meeting private? What they wanted me to say, I understood. I said, well, I did check in on Facebook. They said, thank you. Right. So it's most spies, most puppets of Putin don't say, I'm about to put polonium in this man's sushi at the <laughs> restaurant. I do hope they serve, you know, rice. It just doesn't happen. And and part of the reason I checked in was because not only am I not politically a Trump supporter, but all my friends are radical diehard liberals. So anytime I ever saw Trump, mentioned Trump, they would go ballistic on social media. And I love that. <laughs> So as I also told Mueller's people who laughed the way you are, I said, it just made me happy. It makes me a horrible person, but it made me happy. And so I love the idea of saying this time, not only am I walking past Trump Tower, I'm going to a meeting there. Hello. And it sent them ballistic. But again, it was a really good thing that I did it because it was another thing. They had this idea that it was this covert, you know, spy meeting. Well, you don't normally say, had a Starbucks up at Trump Tower going to the meeting at Trump Tower. You don't. Yeah. And so that's what happened. And it, it was kind of bizarre, to say the least. But that was the meeting. And even then, I thought nothing of it. The only thing I thought was, what a waste of time. And a few months later, after Trump had become president, Emin said, my dad would like you again to ask for a meeting. And this time, I was a bit wiser, not because of the content. I thought, I can't ask them again. They'll think I'm an idiot, a complete idiot. So I sent it on Thanksgiving or just before Thanksgiving Day. I knew no one would read it. And I sort of said, if you can or you can't. And I sent it to someone again that was very connected. I never heard, I never followed up. Usually I follow up everything. And about three months after that, one of Emin's dad's colleagues said, this same lawyer will be back in the States and this and would like to meet. And this time I said, you have to stop asking. It was an appalling meeting. It was awful. And I won't do an ask. And they said, understood. And I never heard about it again. But there are people, still some people, who still think that you, uh, Rob Goldstone, are part of an illegal Russian conspiracy. What would you say to them? I would say get off Twitter, because I've read these people. <laughs> you know, there are people who even today say, we understand that Bob Mueller, who had $34 million, 16 attorneys, hundreds of investigators, the FBI, the CIA, the whatever, spent two years investigating this, came up with the idea that the meeting basically was a nothing. It shouldn't have taken place, and yes, they should have done it. But what they basically said was that Don Jr. was a bit too dumb with the best will in the world to know he shouldn't have done it, and therefore there were no charges to bring against him. It also had nothing of any value to the campaign. 
Yeah, and it doesn't say that the Russians didn't collude. It just says, Correct. yeah. And I've never said that. The Russians might. But I also think, on some level, Britain's probably interfered in people's elections around the world. America's interfered in elections around the world. And Russia and China and whoever else. So, but that's not what was being discussed. Um, there are people on Twitter that say, forget Bob Mueller, forget Congress, forget this. They've missed it all. It's obvious. Here's Rob Goldstone's email. So, you know, Jack Smith sat in wherever Birkenhead thinks, actually believes that they have solved it. And it used to be that I used to try and calmly answer these people. There's no point. If you believe what you believe, then you believe it. What I now say to people is, it's a quote I stole. Now, I do get quotes wrong, so I'll try this one. It's a quote I stole from an old Democratic uh, congressman who said, you're entitled to your own opinions. You're not entitled to your own facts. And that's what I say to people. I don't care if you like me, hate me, think I'm a this, but you can't say that I am because it's not true. And that's, that's where I leave it. But yes, there are people that believe all those people missed the obvious and why because mine's in writing i have to say mine at one point was the only tangible piece of evidence of any russian collusion and i stated in my book and i stated it many times publicly if the Mueller, if the Mueller inquiry was going to believe that my email was a part of the cornerstone of russia gate there wouldn't be any collusion <laughs> because i know what that was and that is basically what it said yeah so let's go back to the very beginning then. You grew up in Greater Manchester in Bury or Bury is the uh, I did. is the uh, So the tell me about that. Mad. What was that like then for you as a you kid? You know, it was it was pretty normal, pretty average. I grew up in a working class council estate in Whitefield just outside Bury and you know, I went to a a very odd school. I actually went to a school originally at one point called Delamere Forest School for delicate Jewish children, which I find <laughs> I mean you have no chance, right? ever in life but that was the name of the school thank god they closed it down after 150 years and um and then i went to um a, a regular comprehensive school where when i was about 16 we had a careers day and everyone was saying you know i want to be a baker i want to be a plumber i want to be a whatever and they came to me and i said i want to be a journalist and they said you can't and i thought well that's handy so i left and I told the headmaster I was never coming back to the school. And in fact, I didn't. And what I did instead was I applied. I'd seen an ad for a trainee sports reporter on the local newspaper. I applied for it. I knew nothing about sport. And I got the job. Much to my shock, I got the job. And the other thing I didn't tell them, but I always used to laugh at them and say, you didn't actually ask but you had to be 18 because part of it was you went on this NCTJ, this journalism course, and you had to be 18. So they assumed anyone who was doing this was at least 18. And when it all came out about six months later that I wasn't, because I was actually then 16 and a half, um, it was too late because they already liked what I'd done and I'd got into it. And not only was I the trainee sports reporter, I was the only sports reporter. So, you know, as you know, you get into a situation where you become good if you like what you're doing. I loved what I was doing. And I was a journalist. That was it. And maybe I did it to spite Elliot Weisberg, who was the name of the careers teacher. But maybe I did it to spite the school. I have no idea. But I liked it. I enjoyed it. Uh, and then I moved on to weekly papers, daily papers. I went to Birmingham, to the Birmingham Post and Mail. Um, I freelanced in London on Fleet Street. I worked for The Sun and The Sunday Mirror. And then I got into radio, which was my kind of true love. And I, I worked for Radio City and for Piccadilly and for LBC. And then I worked for BRMB in Birmingham for a, a long time. BRMB is, is a station I worked at for, for quite a long time as well. I think, what is that? Were we there together? No. No, I wasn't there until I went there in 99 and left oh, in okay. about 2002. So actually, I say a long time. It was a long time for commercial yeah. radio, uh, but yeah, that was uh, that was that was my time there. Well, when I, I first went there, we were in Aston, and we moved to Broad Street when I was there. So we were near the HP Source factory. Yeah, um, but that which, which I have for someone who I only have um, one hate in life. Uh, I, well, I have two. I hate the word collusion, but I also hate all condiments. So I have an aversion to them. So if you can imagine going to work every day with that smell of HP sauce, that was a nightmare. But yes, I loved my time in Birmingham and at BRMB. And you managed to take Muhammad Ali 
to BRMB to that very studio by the HP Source factory. In their beaten up old radio car, I did. <laughs> I had um, I'd got assigned to cover Ali, who was visiting a boys, a boys club in Handsworth that had just started a boxing uh, club. And it was amazing. First of all, the idea that Muhammad Ali would be coming to spend two days. Imagine two days. Now, like Kim Kardashian spends 10 minutes somewhere. Two days he spent visiting with, naming the center after him and all that. It was amazing. So I said to you, I said, this job's me. It's got me written all over it. I'm done. I'm doing this. And I literally moved in there. I befriended everyone. I was friendly. I, I went there a week or two out, and, and so they all would know me. And it was with a view to getting an interview with Muhammad Ali. Nobody knew if he would say one word, two words, no words. And the first day he was great. He said little bits of things that, you know, he used to mumble a bit and say things. And I, I knew uh, being in radio, you can chop that together, do your own report, and there you go. And on the way out, there was a very famous sports editor named Tony Butler. And he said to me, I bet you don't get an interview with Muhammad Ali. And I was like, no, I will. And he said, oh, you, I think he said something like, oh, it's a shame he can't be in my show. And Tony had a sports show the next day on the Friday. Fine. So I go there and the first day I got bits of it. And one of the things I said to Ali after spending a day, I was like, I'd love to do an interview with you. And he said, tomorrow. I thought, okay, he's going to be here tomorrow. So the next day I go back. And on my way out from the station, I said to Tony Butler, I'm going to get you that interview. And, you know, again, you're under pressure. This must have been about 10 or 11 in the morning. He's on at four in the afternoon. It's like, OK. But the idea was I would get it, race back to the station and do something with it. And Ali wasn't that communicative, I have to say, that day. And I thought, he's never doing this thing. So I kind of went for it. And I just said to him towards the end of the afternoon, remember that interview you said you would do? Yeah. And I was ready to say, well, let's sit down here. And he goes, you got a car? And I said, yes. And he goes, then let's go and do it. And it clicked that he thought it was live in the state. Oh, no, live or not live. It was in the studio. I was like, sure. So I drove Muhammad Ali in the beaten up white with that red BRMB on it. News car, an old Ford Escort to Aston, parked in the back, not even in the front, in the back of the car. And then we walked. Now, those were days before cell phones or anything. <laughs> so it wasn't like I'm dialing up saying, guess who I was? <clears throat> so I walked in with Muhammad Ali and I knew what I had to do. We just barged into the studio and Tony had his little panel of people. And it was one of the only times I ever saw Tony Butler speechless, number one. And Muhammad Ali sat down. He's live on air. Hour, live on air for an hour, answer questions. And when he left, Tony Butler was shocked. And my news editor at the time was a guy called Brian Shepard, just simply said, you do have more front than Brighton. <laughs> so <coughs> was, was pulling that off, because that was, a, that was a, a coup, was pulling that off part of the inspiration to become a, a publicist and a manager of artists? No, I don't think then it was. Um, what happened then was I ended up going to, I kind of emigrated to Australia as many Brits do. And as part of that, I ended up uh, working at AAP, which is like the press association there, and working, um, doing a lot of entertainment stories. And I heard one day that Michael Jackson would be coming to town. And that's another figure that immediately I thought, aha, I have to be involved with that. So once again, I ingratiated myself with all those that were necessarily to be ingratiated with. And I got invited to the launch of this, uh, of his tour. And at the tour, I asked his publicist, how do I get on this tour? Because at the moment, all I've got is an invitation on a boat to a launch and hopefully a pair of tickets to the show. And um, he said, you need to go and speak to his manager, Frank DeLeo. And Frank DeLeo is a very famous manager. He looked like Danny DeVito. He's about four foot nothing and long hair and a big cigar and quite a large chap. And I went up and I said something like, I can't remember that. I said, hey, I'm Rob Goldstone. I'm a short, fat reporter from AAP. And he goes, yeah, I'm a short, fat manager of Michael Jackson. How do you do? Now, again, it's one of those moments. He could have gone, are you mad or who cares? But he didn't. It was a kind of, And he said, so what can I do for you? And I said, I'd really like to come on this tour. And he goes, well, then you need to get accredited. Go over there. And when I went back, the accreditation they gave me was all access. I could do everything other than do a moonwalk on the stage. 
And suddenly I became part of that tour. And I remember again calling my boss saying, you won't see me for 10 days, I'm going on this tour. What tour? It doesn't matter, Michael Jackson. And I said, I'll file stories every day. You're a press agency, that is what we do. And they were very excited. They were like, but you won't get to talk to him. I said, I'm just telling you, I'll file stories every day. And I filed tons of stories and they got loads of stuff. And I spent 10 days on the road with Michael Jackson, but not just on the road. I traveled with him. I was on planes with him. I sat next to him on flights. We talked about nonsense. And I got to know a little bit about Michael Jackson, meaning how he ticks. Well, of course, we've had the Leaving Neverland uh, documentaries recently. Did you see anything that you thought wasn't quite right at the time? I didn't. I think I was too young and too naive and actually too excited to be around Michael Jackson to even pay much attention to that because I wasn't on the tour as kind of like an investigative journalist. I was on there as a bit of an entertainment journalist who's getting this big scoop, hopefully. And, you know, when that happens, you have to be... I'm not, I'm not um, a sycophantic person, but I know how to ingratiate myself quite well. So I wasn't going to suddenly say, tell me the bad things about Michael Jackson, or even like, I hear you speak to a chimp. That was off limits to me, because that was what I was hoping would happen when we sat down for a big interview. Now, I never got a big interview, because what Michael agreed to was, he said he didn't like interviews, but he would talk to me. He kept saying that same thing. I'm talking, you're talking, you can write. And I understood that. So I would get lots of stuff, but I never got one big interview. I got lots of, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? How this, what that? Um, what I did notice was there was, I don't know if there were two, but there was definitely one young child that was dressed bizarrely, sometimes almost even dressed the same as Michael, who spent a lot of time with him. But I noticed that that child's parents were always put up in, if Michael had the best suite, they had the second best suite. If Michael went in this limo, they went in the one behind. And I was like, who are these people? I never thought about it as in, who are these people? There's something weird going on. I just thought, who is it? They didn't fit in. It didn't look like Michael Jackson. He's... Now, years later, that was one of the, Austra I don't know if his name's Wade Robson. He might be called that. One of the kids was who, Wade. Was yeah. Yeah, yeah. who was Australian. And the only thing I have to say, because I didn't see anything, I just saw him around was when Michael was brought up on charges, and then later when Michael died, I've been interviewed by a lot of people over the years about this, and when Never uh, uh, Leaving Neverland came out, I was interviewed. Dan Wharton interviewed me and all of that. And they all said the same thing, which is like, well, it's right, he should have been brought up on charges. And I said, but if you're gonna bring him up on charges, I would have those parents standing next to him. Because they Michael Jackson wasn't a predator who went into the streets or went into a park and grabbed people or groomed people. These people literally handed him their child while they were kind of entertained like the king and queen in some suite somewhere. And I just think there's something very morally wrong with the idea that you and your husband are up there in a suite and you're, I don't know how old it was, 10 year old, 12 year old kid, is actually staying with Michael Jackson who mm. you don't know, really. Mm. If you don't think that's wrong, okay, you don't think it's wrong, but you do know it's right. And in fact, I think one of the mothers said it, and, and, and ironically, I've never seen that documentary, but I think one of the mothers did say it in that documentary that with hindsight, we were wrong to do that, to not like go, this is weird. But that's what I'm saying. It's not like Michael Jackson stole their kid and took him to Australia or took him to somewhere they were kind of almost like active participants in this. And I found that all very strange. But in answer to your question, no, I never saw anything untoward happen with him. What I saw was a very shy, very odd, very childlike, very unusual genius. Hmm. And, and really, that is the only word for him. I've never since or expect to again or before seen anybody with the magnitude of talent that he had. i never seen anybody, it was Jekyll and Hyde. It was almost like this shy wallflower who can't even speak loud enough that you can hear. You have to like crank an hour or two later is holding 50,000 people's attention for two and a half hours. It's amazing, mm. amazing. Mm. And after that, then you went the full showbiz, didn't you? you the, well, the, that was like, I can't go back to covering, <laughs> like, you know, Warunga Council. I just can't. 
<laughs> so again, for the second time in my life, I was like, I'm not doing this. I'm moving on. I'm now a publicist, whatever that means. And I joined forces with, with the, the, the lady who'd been Michael's Australian publicist. And over the years, we did some pretty great things. We, we represented Richard Branson and Peter Morton, who owns Hard Rock Cafes. I launched HMV over there, the music chain. And we did, I don't know, Cindy Lauper and B.B. King and James Taylor and Bros. Oh, my God. I launched Bros. Remember that band? A band who I always remember this. I said to the promoter, they won't get in their limos because they're black. And they said, celebrities only travel in white limos. And I always remember this. And he said, why don't you tell them that that limo will last longer than them? (laughs) I thought that was hilarious. Um, but yes, yeah, so we did all of that. It was all great. And, um, and I became a publicist overnight. So there you go. I'm now a publicist for years. Who was your favorite person to work with during that time? To work with. So to meet and to work with was probably Michael Jackson. To work with would be Richard Branson. Because yeah. in the same way as Michael Jackson was a genius and not of this world, Richard Branson had an element of that. He was someone who literally, if you said, you know what, you want to make the front page tomorrow, why don't I push you off a cliff? He'd be like, that's an amazing idea. Like, can we get two cameras there instead of three? So he understood how PR worked. He understood how the media worked brilliantly. And he was fearless, almost in a scary way. I mean, I write in my book that I saved his life. He would have electrocuted himself and died if we'd done the original plan that he had to to launch himself and Virgin Megastores in Australia. We actually switched it at the last minute and uh, he ended up in his pilot's outfit water skiing up Sydney Harbour and then proceeded to throw in most of the TV present in Australia into the harbour, which is quite odd, and we made the front page. But he's brilliant like that. I remember uh, getting him knighted by a lookalike of the Queen in Melbourne and having a full royal procession down the streets of Melbourne. He loved it, and I remember him saying to me, because I would never get knighted in real life, Thank you, Sir Richard Branson, as you are now. I did it 20 years earlier. But yes, so he was great. And you How did you just... nearly kill him, though? What, what happened there? So or, he... or how did you save his life? So he planned, he was launching Virgin Megastores there, and a monorail had been built in Sydney that would lead directly into Darling Harbour, where his uh, Virgin Megastore was. And we had this idea that he would abseil, because that was his new fad, he would abseil down a building, it was actually Centre Point Tower, because you know Australia quite well. Yeah, yeah, he would yeah. abseil down Centre Point Tower and land on the monorail, and then a bit like Spider-Man would clamber on it and end up at the Virgin Megastore. That was a brilliant idea until the day before I called somebody at Sydney City Council and said, although this monorail isn't operational, is it electrified? They said, yes. So I said, if someone was to abseil onto it, they said, well, A, they'd be arrested, but we could deal with that. But B, they'd be dead. And I was like, oh, there you go. So when I told him, he was very disappointed, but immediately came up and said, let's do something on the harbor. Let blah, 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 blah. And then because he has that kind of brain, within a few hours, he knows what he's doing again. And as I say, that's very rare, very rare that people behave like that. And he's one of those. And um, yeah, it, it is who he is. Like, I, I honestly believe if I'd said to him, he's also like a sponge. So he takes in what people say. If I'd said to him, oh, hey, Richard, you know, people eat, um, what, rocks off the beach in Sydney. I guarantee he would have gone, we should do Virgin Rocks. <laughs> like, he was one of those people that no matter, he would always give it a go to think about it, have someone. I never heard him ever say, oh, that's a horrible idea. He was m- much more welcoming of ideas. So he was probably, just because he was fun, he was probably one of my favorite. And he wrote me a letter that said that was the most amazing launch I've ever had. So I thought, oh, there you go, right. So there. Because he's been involved in some big launches too, to come from him, yeah. Yeah, and it's a long time ago. This is like 1980, whatever it is, seven, eight, I don't know, something like that. So. And yeah. then from Australia, you moved to New York, where you are now. Right. Um, so in Australia, due to my overwhelming success with Virgin, I was poached for want of a better word by hmv which at the time were the world's largest record stores and i ended up doing pr for them then the then boss said to me um would you run our international marketing and i said sure i don't know what that means but sure so for a couple of years i started out running international marketing and i ended up there for nearly eight or nine years it's just as part of it he said where do you want to live and i said 
I don't know, New York. And he goes, great, I don't care where you live. But, and they were expanding in the States at the time. So they made it possible for me to move to New York and dealt with all the issues of visas and green cards or whatever. And I simply moved to New York and did my job. And over the course of the next I don't know, seven or eight years, we, again, we had amazing, amazing fun. I had an amazing boss. And my job was to help with the drama of opening new territories, new stores. I had Paul McCartney walk to a, to a, an HMV store and just suddenly appear and thousands of people. We did stuff with Madonna and Prince. I had Prince on the roof play, like mad things that all became very second nature to me. And so I tried to say that to people. So when someone says to me, can you call the Trumps and ask for a meeting? <laughs> it's not shocking to me. It's just yet another ask. I think context in a lot of these things is really important. So, you know, if, if my neighbor said to me, oh, someone asked me to call the Trumps for a meeting, I would be shocked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'm not shocked at myself because I've done crazier things. It turns out I haven't done crazier things than that now. But I mean, to me, it was just another ask. It was just another one of these crazy things. And you got involved with the Friars Club and their famous celebrity roasts and some lifetime achievement galas for, for different people. And you also crossed paths with the comedian Jerry Lewis. Oh, I did cross paths with him. <laughs> so he's a hateful, awful man, but he was a very good comedian and actor. But he's known for being an awful, hateful man. It's not just me saying it. And he hates the press. And if you're the publicist for someone that hates the press, that's a great job. <laughs> so when he was 85... Um, he had a birthday party at the Friars and lots of his acting friends were there and I had the press and I suppose to spite me because I had the press there, he'd agreed to do a photo. So we had tons of press, but he wouldn't face them because as he told me, he hadn't agreed to face them. He would just agreed to do the photo. So he stood with his back to the cameras and whatever they were used to. And it's a funny photo anyway of Jerry Lewis with his back to you. And um, he sat down and uh, the entertainment editor for the Associated Press said to me, He's 85. I would love to talk to him for a few minutes about his birthday, his life, whatever. I thought that was a very fair request, which he would never do anyway, so let's ask. So I went up and I approached him. He was sitting down. He was all excited. He got these gifts from his actor friends. And I said, um, there's a, a journalist who I know very well. He's a very legitimate, very nice journalist. Would like to speak to you for five minutes about your life. And Jerry Lewis stopped in his tracks and said to me, come here and pointed at me. And he said, let me get this right. You believe that my life can be summed up in five minutes? And I said, well, obviously not, no. And he goes, but that's what you just said. You said five minutes. And I said, he just needs five minutes to talk about your 85. And he goes, so the publicist, my publicist here, thinks my life can be summed up in five minutes. At which point, you know, the only thing to do is literally leave. And I just said, okay, if you prefer, you could do an hour with him, but you're not gonna do it anyway. So my question is, would you like to spend five minutes with him? At which point he picked up a salami and threw it at me. To which I said to him, happy birthday and goodbye. And I left. And I always liked it because it's a ridiculous story. About a year later, I was doing a tribute for the Friars to Tom Cruise. And it so happened that Tom Cruise and me were in a very tiny anteroom of the kitchen at the Waldorf Astoria. And um, I don't often do this, but I said to him, would you do a selfie with me? And he said, sure, if you tell me that about when Jerry Lewis threw a salami at you. <laughs> and I said, how would you possibly know that? And he said, because I just realized that this was you because my publicist pointed it out and she was there when this happened and she was telling some friends on a boat we were on at the Cannes Film Festival and it sounded funny, will you tell me? So I told him this mad story and he laughed. Tom Cruise has a funny laugh, so he laughed. And then he said, you can take your selfie. And I was a bit starstruck and I couldn't remember how you take a picture on an iPhone. So I pushed a button that was like movie and he laughed and he goes, see, you've now got the shortest movie I ever made. <laughs> and it was funny. But yes, in answer to your question, I did the Friars Club. So we did people like Quentin Tarantino and Larry King and um, 
uh, now I can't remember anybody's name, but we did um, Tony Bennett and Martin Scorsese. The thing about working for something iconic like the Friars Club is they were the home of Dean Martin and, and Jerry Lewis and Frank Sinatra. He was the abbot of the Friars Club for about 20 years. So these people were iconic that we worked with. It was shocking. And I'll say it again, because of the types of asks I was asked to do, why would being asked to talk to Donald Trump's <laughs> low-level son, I don't mean this in a bad way, or, or why would that phase me? But people don't understand why it wouldn't have phased me. Yeah, yeah. Well, your podcast is called An Englishman In, so I immediately think of the, the Sting song, An Englishman in New York, which I think was about Quentin Crisp. Um, do you find yourself being that Englishman in New York? I don't like coffee, I like tea, my dear. Has, has living in America, has it made you more British? Uh, it's made me more grand as well as more <laughs> British. Because I have to say, again, I'm from Bury. Yeah. So really, I'd like to say, give us a cup of tea, Chuck, before you can wear it. But I don't here. I'm terribly like, do you have Earl Grey in, you know, fresh leaf tea? And it's also good to be British in America because even though it's 2020, most Americans, when you speak with a British accent, behave like it's 1753. And they go, is that a British accent? Could you speak for us? And they really are genuinely charmed and aghast that you speak with a British accent. They then, in today's world, will say things like, is where you live like Downton Abbey? Do you wear <laughs> tiaras? I mean, it really is shocking the level at which, and I like the one that I often get uh, said to me, which is, oh my God, you speak like the Prince of Wales. And I always say, I don't. And you obviously have no idea how he speaks, but that's okay. So to me, as a kid from Manchester, it's all hilarious. Now, when I go back to England, I'm much more like, hello, Chuck, you're right. I mean, I'm not. I don't turn suddenly into Les Dawson or somebody. <laughs> but I do, um, it is a bit grand here. And, and, and a lot of my friends who are expats say the same thing, which is they become terribly hyacinth bouquet over here because it's kind of expected and it opens a lot of doors if you need to open a door here that can't be opened if you ever I, I found it with customer service i found it on phones if you suddenly go what a lovely day it is today don't you think we're having a fine summer they'll go is that english that you're speaking <laughs> now it's funny because we allegedly speak the same language but we don't and so yes i, I become much more british here the podcast then uh, an Englishman in. Why a podcast now after doing so many things? Journalist, best-selling author, um, publicist. You've done it all. Why a podcaster right now? Um, I toyed with the idea of doing a podcast right when I did my book, which is about two years ago now. And I actually thought no one would care. And I couldn't think of a title. And I couldn't think of a reason to do it. Like, I was like, I can't just do a podcast there has to be a theme a reason why am i doing it and i do think titles are really important uh, maybe it comes from my journalist thing but i always write even when i pitch stories as a publicist i always pitch them in a headline that i think will grab so i needed something and an englishman in i liked because it doesn't have a final word and i did it because every episode has its own final word so there's an Englishman in power, an Englishman in collusion, an Englishman in lockdown, an Englishman in Eurovision, which is one of my favorite ones. Uh, you know, an Englishman in technophobia, because I don't know how to work any machinery. And I just thought each one would be theme-based and the guests would be booked, not for who they were or who they're not, but for what they could speak about. And um, once I'd started it, I understood what I wanted to do. I didn't really understand it when I first began plotting it out but now i find them really interesting and i find the people who i've spoken to really interesting and I, I think people like to be i think people like conversation i like people like michael parkinson russell harty kenneth williams is like my idol because kenneth williams could go on anything and talk for an hour <laughs> and you'd be thoroughly entertained you may have no idea what on earth he was talking about at the end of it but you'd be entertained i don't think there's a lot that like graham norton does it to some extent but i don't think but I like Terry Wogan more than I like Graham Norton because I think he was more interested in letting you speak. Michael Parkinson, because he'd been a journalist, 
he knew when to speak and when not to speak type of thing and when to let you tell the story. I think there's some great examples, David Frost, all those people. So I'm interested in people. I like what people have to say. I think that's why a person becomes a journalist. And podcasting is the natural extension to that. Um, and I hope people will like the episodes. As I say, you can pick and choose. If you like politics, there's political ones. If you like the Eurovision Song Contest, there's a hilarious one about Eurovision. And if you want to know why, you know, Bet Midler's a bitch and George Michael like rough sex. Listen to my one called In the Groove with a big music expert, and he'll tell you exactly what I just said. Um, one of my favorites is with a gossip columnist here in New York called Rob Shooter. And I asked him what advice he would give for Harry and Meghan. And his answer's hilarious. He goes, I just would say to them three things Is the palace dirty? Does the queen really like those dogs? I mean, he's hilarious. And and it's like, you know, I think people will be entertained by that because it, it, it's a bit of escapism. Um, yeah, in, 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 my, in my book, we all need a bit of that, especially in this lockdown madness. It's called An Englishman Inn. It is Rob Goldstone. Continued success with this new venture in your life, Rob. And thank, thank you, you very much uh, for talking to me. Really appreciate your time. Thank Thanks. you. Make Thank sure you, you get it. Up. An Englishman in, Rob Goldstone.